Okay, let's turn to Romans 8. You know, we're progressing through Romans 8. And Jason and I were talking earlier, he said he was reading some things in Romans 8 and then going back to Genesis. Is there anyone, any questions or any thoughts that anyone has about uh, some of these things we're going over? And again, it's these are these are questions that are designed to, to probe our heart and to work in our heart. Uh, to to teach us some things about how our Heavenly Father is for us, and that we can trust Him no matter what we go through. Uh, any any do you, have, do you have something, Jason? Uh, this is this that the whole book's for us for our, our learning, our understanding, and to uh, to go back and you know, to constantly be in His Word, which uh, I, I know that I'm guilty of not being in it probably. Right? But just to get it and then be thankful and then have that understanding and spirit working through you that you, when you do go through something that you've already read, how it, how it manifests itself again and again and again. That's true. That, like you said, you just said, we don't need teachers or governors or all that to go through on the year or so. Let the spirit work through us now. Yeah. And, and what you said is an important principle, and that is that we have a certain responsibility in our sanctified life. Um, we have to know these doctrines. And then when I say doctrines, it's talking about the things the Apostle Paul is teaching us as we progress in our edification. So we have a, a responsibility. We, we need to see it's important to value the Word of God and to apply it to the details of our life. And to and as we progress, especially in Romans 12, we'll see the outworking of these things as God begins to teach us about godly love. And without him teaching us, we would never be able to manifest godly love. He has to teach us about godly love, how to love one another, how to love like he does. Any Anything else? Any? Boy, he and I talked about earlier um, is how a lot of times the tendency is to come to a, a meeting or go to church, listen to the to the speaker, and then oh, that's it. You know, then you go home. But you know, a friend of mine, she we we do coaching and teaching. I, I do some teaching, and then afterwards, she told me this time she take she doesn't stop there. And when we get off the phone, she just continues and lets the Holy Spirit teach her. That's when she's really learning. Not not from anything I said. But maybe I encouraged her in the Word. But once you take it and it's you and God, that's where the effectual working comes. The I, Spirit backs up what she said. Exactly. Proving it. Wow, this is wow. Not that magnifies it even more. Yes. But it's the work, the responsibility we have. You know, as, as we go through, <clears throat> you know, the first eight chapters of Roman, obviously there's there's um, foundational doctrines are justified standing before God, Romans uh, three through five, and Romans six through eight is our is our sanctification, and it's really just the foundation of our sanctified life, because as we progress in the Scripture, we don't put the sanct our sanctification behind us. What it is is this is the foundation, and we're building. Really, I don't know the right way to say it, but it's really this, our sanctified life that's being constructed and that we're living out of. Because if you go to certain scriptures, saints that have been taught advanced doctrine, their sanctification is still the issue. 
is still important. And even in Thessalonians, it talks about being um, being sanctified wholly, our spirit, soul, and body. And that's that's way out there in advanced doctrine of First Thessalonians. So sanctification is not just something we're learning in, we're learning in Romans six through eight, and then it's kind of well we got to learn other things now. This is in view all through our Christian life, our sanctified life, and being able to live under God and walking as an adopted son and uh, being able to please God in the details of our life. Uh, just one verse, uh, turn back to Acts chapter 20. I know we've gone over this, but we really want to just say a little bit about it because this kind of sums up what I was trying to say. Yeah, but you want to read Acts 20, 32? Brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sent. Okay, the Apostle Paul, he's going to Jerusalem after this is at the end of his third apostolic journey. And he calls for the Ephesian elders. He has something he needs to say to them. Because he knows he's he's not just an apostle, he's a prophet, right? He knows something's going to happen to the Ephesian church. Church or churches, I don't you know, however you want to say it. And he he gathers them together and he he he'd been instructing them for three years, not basic doc. Well, I mean, he would have taught them basic doctrines. But he taught them some advanced doctrines. That's what Ephesians is. It's advanced doctrines. But their sanctifi sanctification is still the issue. He says, and now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. The, the word of God's grace is able to build them up and give them inheritance. We're all sanctified in Christ. But you know what? Some saints, because they don't walk consistently with their sanctified life, they're not going to get an inheritance out of their sanctification. That's what Paul tells the Corinthians. He says you're going to suffer loss. They didn't have any, they didn't see any value to their sanctified life. And why didn't they? Any thoughts? What is Corinthians? Yeah, they're still wrapped up in. They were carnal. And the question is, why were they carnal? What were, what were they focusing on rather than their sanctified position in Christ? What were they focusing on? The law, which would have been really that religious system that, you know, going back to Israel's program. And then there was an additional component about the wisdom of this world. They valued that, didn't they? So they thought they were reigning as kings. They they were puffed up. We've talked about this about being puffed. They they knew a lot of things, but they were puffed up. They didn't. They weren't working in their heart. And Paul says to the Ephesians, he says, "Which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance." It's the doctrines of God's grace that will do that. We need to be working in our inner man. Okay, that's what will build us up and give us an inheritance among them which are sanctified. So our sanctification. You know, this issue of being dead to sin and alive unto God, being able to please God in the details of our life. This is an, this is an important issue until we leave this world. It's important. And no matter how much we learn, this is still the issue. So this, this sanctified um, house that we're going to build, so to speak, we have a foundation that's laid in Romans 6 through 8. And then this, you know, it begins to be constructed in Romans you know, really Romans uh, 9 through 16. And then there's going to be attack on your sanctification. That's what Corinthians through Galatians deals with. And then our sanctification, living in our sanctified house with the heavenly places in view. But, but our sanctification is still the issue. It's just that God gives us how to put the sanctification in view in light of his purpose for us in the heavenly places. And then we see the Thessalonians, the the attacks on our sanctification, the advanced attacks, this is the sufferings and not understanding sometimes, you know, the timeline and where we fit into God's purpose and program. 
So, but sanctification is always the issue as we progress in our Christian life. It's it's important. Okay, so let's let's uh, Romans eight. Uh, Deborah, do you want to read Romans eight verses thirty one through thirty five? Okay, you know, as we go through specifically this section of Romans 8, there's a couple of things that are going to come up that are going to set the stage for Paul needing to, that he will need to explain to us what happened to Israel. And that, just keep that in the back of your mind. One is God's elect. Our thinking might be, well, wait a minute, wasn't Israel God's elect? Doesn't it talk about that in the Old Testament? It does. Mm -hmm. And then it's going to say, who can separate us from the love of Christ? Well, what happened to Israel? Didn't they get separated from what God was doing? So just keep that in the back of your mind, because Paul addresses, the, I shouldn't say Paul, God addresses things to us, not just that, not just how he addresses them, but when he addresses them. That's important to understand that, that God is, God answers questions um, when the questions are going to come up in our thinking. So that's an important principle. Like, you know, this is the perfect book that God wrote. He addresses things that our, our mind will, will bring up as far as questions. And we can go back and see examples of this, but we're not going to do that right now. Okay, so just keep that in the back of your mind. When we get to Romans 9 through 11, those are things that are going to come. Those are things Paul needs to address. Uh, according to God's uh, God's revelation, or Christ's revelation, I should say. Okay, so just to review these first two real quickly, uh, the first one, if God be for us. You know, that that word if is a qualifier, isn't it? It's, you know, when we say, if God is for us, well, is God for us? That's right. Chapters one through eight has manifested that, right? Hasn't it? Yeah. Yep. He justified us. He sanctified us. We're adopted sons and daughters. He, through these sufferings, you know, and if, if we suffer with Christ, if we, if we see them the way he does and suffer with him, God, God wants us to be a joint heir with Christ. He wants us to be conformed to Christ's likeness. He has set some things from eternity past to eternity future, and we're the focus of what he's doing. He's for us. And what we looked at last week was he that spared not his own son, but delivered up for us, delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Does God want to, let's see, you know, the first issue is Christ was delivered up for us all. Not just for saints, right? He, unto all and upon all them that believe. He's, he functioned as the redeemer for all. And God was able to do that because with Israel put aside, God is free to go to the whole world. There no, there's no middle wall of partition. There's no Israel nigh unto God and the Gentiles far off, right? Okay. We understand there were some dispensational things that God had to accomplish to do this. Was the middle wall of partition just like doctrinal truth? Yeah. I guess the whole thing that they were it was the 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 law and the commandments and it was a middle wall it functioned as a middle wall of partition because it was they were entrusted to Israel to them were committed the oracles of God it was it was their oracles and um so they, the the law actually it it fortified or strengthened that middle wall because they, they were the circumcision Gentiles were far off. So it really strengthened or, or made stronger that middle wall. So circumcision began 
that uh, actually the Abraham Covenant I and then the circumcision. I mean, it's really easy to create conflict at the same time. And I remember learning about it. And I uh, was thinking about it the other day. And I haven't had such a the, the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. I remember having such a hard time in school and stuff. And it's like, then I finally gave my heart to Christ. And um, I started like interpreting things, not, not divinely perspective like I was expected, but that I was finally understanding some definitions of words and all that stuff. It just, you had the Spirit of God to teach you those yeah, things. Yeah, freaking. Yeah. Made a lot. That's a good point. Like, wow. Yeah, so that, you know, there was the Abrahamic covenant and then there was circumcision and then the law. Those, 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 it was a fortified middle wall that God constructed. It's not that he didn't care about the Gentiles. The Gentiles, if they responded properly, God would justify them. He, they could even be become a Jew, right? Yeah. So Christ was delivered up for us all. He is, he is our kinsman redeemer. He, he uh, unto all and upon all them that believe. And then it says, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Well, you know, this is in the context of our sanctified life that he's going to give us all things. This isn't talking about justification. This, this section is talking about our, our being an adopted son, our being joint heir, conform to the likeness of Christ, those things come out of our sanctified life, don't they? There, you know, there are people that are justified. You know what? They put the word of God aside and they have no interest in the Bible. It's not talking about those people here. Now, they're justified. They have a reward. But this is talking about a reward amongst them that are sanctified, being conformed to Christ's likeness, being a joint heir. That's the context of when it says, he shall, give, he shall freely give us all things. Okay. Uh, just quickly, let's turn back to Luke chapter 15. Luke, um, there's a parable back here that I think it explains this principle, even in Israel's program. And this is the, this is the prodigal son. You know, we, we know the one son leaves. He wants his inheritance. But the other son is laboring with the father. And he sees this other son who squandered his inheritance and the father welcomes him back. And he's, he's, up, he's, up, he's upset, isn't he? He says, why are you, why are you doing this? He says, you, you never provided this for me so I can make merry with my friends. And here's what the father says to him. Luke 15. 31, and he said unto him, son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. See, that comes out, that comes out of this, this son was laboring with the father, but he didn't understand all the aspects of the reward and what he was going to get. You know, so there will be those in Israel's program that, that they didn't properly understand these things. But, you know, for us today, Romans 8 begins to explain these things, doesn't it? And these things come out of our sanctified life. Okay, turn back to uh, Romans 8. And it's, you know, and where, you know, when it says he'll freely give us all things, where are all these things that the Father is going to give us? Say it again. In in Christ, in heavenly places, in Christ Jesus. So you're right, you, but they're all in Christ, aren't they? And they're in heavenly places. They're not the things down here that our Father has given us. Things down here, you know what? They're going to pass away. You know, money, houses, lands, all these things. They're 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 going to come to naught. They're going to come to nothing. These that isn't what our Father possesses. This is the things of this world. Okay. Okay, uh, Romans chapter 8. Any questions on, on those two issues? And again, these are things, these are things we need to uh, address in, in our heart, whether we really believe these things. Because the other, the other questions come out 
of these two foundational issues, don't they? It's for us. And if he's for us, again, does it matter who's against us? Who matter? Who is against us? The devil, of course, of this world. Paul talks about there are many. Say that again. Our own pride. Our, our flesh. You're right. Our pride, our flesh. And Paul says there are many adversaries. And you know what? Those are men. You're not talking about angelic beings. He's talk, those are men that are following the course of this world and opposing God's purpose. A lot of them were Jews. A lot of them were very religious people. We were talking about that earlier, weren't we? Religious people. Sometimes they have a little bit of understanding. Sometimes they have a lot of understanding. Sometimes they have no understanding. doesn't matter how many years of seminary you've gone to. It's the word of God that gives understanding. When you properly understand the, the, the form of doctrine that God has entrusted to us, you properly form it. Okay, so verse 30 through, 30 through, verse 33, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect. You know, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about this. It's it's a it's the way it says it is kind of kind of hard to, to think about sometimes, isn't isn't it? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? You know, that word charge is an interesting word. What do you think about when you think of the word charge? Okay, that's that, and and that's talking about maybe a little bit of a different charge because chargeable that he's not, he doesn't have, he's not going to take something from somebody, right? Not chargeable, he's not charging them. So that that's a charge that might have a little bit different meaning than than this, but that's that's that uses that word charge, that he's using it, he's preaching. And you, you know, back in, you do all the chores in the morning. Okay. But you're laboring because, like, he's praying because he needed to pray. It was essential, you know, 12 o'clock at night, what have you. Let's, let's turn over to uh, First Timothy. First okay, Timothy. <laughs> First Timothy chapter six, the, the apostle Paul is getting, he's ready to pass off the scene. And Timothy is somebody who's labored with him over the years and he's passing the baton off to Timothy. And he says, not just once, he says it two or three times about a charge that he's gonna to give to Timothy, a charge. Uh, Terry, do you wanna read um, first Timothy six, Verse 13. And being charged in the sight of God, who searches all things, all things, and before any speaker, who will come, not just calling it witnesses, but it's protected. Okay. We should have read the verse before. It talks about fight the good fight of faith. So, in the context of what Timothy is going through and this overwhelming opposition, the, not just from outside, but from within himself. And you, you said it, Brenna, about pride, something that comes from within. But in Timothy's case, it was fear. He was being gripped by fear. And Paul, you know, he writes to him, he says, I give you charge. And, you know, we want to we think about what that means, charge. He's giving Timothy, and this relates to Romans 8, he's giving Timothy some very specific instructions about something Timothy is going through at that particular moment, a warfare. Now, second Timothy begins to talk about this warfare, but first Timothy, it's, it's, it's starting that, that battle, that opposition. Um, Timothy and second, second Timothy, Paul talks about Timothy being ashamed of not just Paul, but of the Lord because of this warfare he was in. So Paul gives him some very specific instructions of charge. He says, Timothy, you need to do this to get through these struggles. You need to do this or you're going to be 
cast away. You're going to be of no value to God. Now you're justified. But, you know, you, you're just, you're going to just depart from these things. And, you, you know, your sanctified life, what's going to happen to a sanctified life? Go on. And with, with that, in, in light of that, let's turn back to Romans 8. Because, you know, as we're going through Romans 8, the Apostle Paul is, is getting ready to tell us some things about the sufferings of Christ. And that's what verse 35 is going to address. These sufferings that if we progress in our sanctified life, if we progress in our edification and these doctrines, begin to be formed in us and Christ's life begins to be manifest in us. That's the purpose of our godly edification and, and our sanctified life. There's going to be attack, an attack from the adversary. So he, he's, he's giving him this charge because of what's coming. There's some specific instructions that we need so that we are ready for this attack. We need we this chart. This is a charge that each one of us needs to address. You know, and I, and I will. Is it so important to me that when this attack comes, that uh, I will say, you know, this is more important than anything else in my life. To please my heavenly Father, to walk before Him as a son or a daughter, and and serve Him. This is, you know, and when it says, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? You know, there, there, there are those around us that will lay a charge, that, that will lay something, that will lay a charge to God's elect. You know, we have, we have a charge. God is charging us that, you know what, this is important. This is our sanctified life. And when it says, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? The question is, who is it? Who is going to lay a charge to God's elect? To me personally, who is who is going to do this? I'm sorry. It could it could be us. We could lay a charge. We could lay something to the charge. We could lay something to this charge that we've been given. That's right. And and when we think about, sometimes it's those that are very close to us. What are you spending so much time in the Bible for? You know, there's other there's other things in life. You know, you, you don't need to study all the time. Isn't that, isn't that laying something to the charge of God's elect? There's other things more important or just as important. Can't be we can't be reading the Bible every day. We can't be reading the Bible ten hours a day. That's right. It, it was an offense to him, seeing that God approved or put his stamp of approval on Abel. Is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah, that was that he was a, he was offended. He, he, I'm just as good as that, you know. And was he was he laying a charge to uh, Abel? Maybe he was. I don't know. Laying something to Abel's charge, but you know when Paul says. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? You know, sometimes it's those that are close, family members, our friends, you know, children. You know, it's just like, I don't want to hear about that. I don't want to hear about that. that, that who could be anything out of, outside of God? I think so. Right. Any, I mean, anyone. Could be ourselves. He's saying that we're, we're God elected. He's elected this position, right? So anybody outside of God could be the people. That's right. Even saints. Yeah, Even saints, absolutely. yeah. So anyone, it's talking about anybody. Else, I think you're right. General... Yeah, and it could be your wife, your spouse, your, like you said, your kids. It could be you know, other other members. I mean, and we see an example of this back in the book of Job. Job's going through these suffering. What does his wife say? Curse God or die. Curse God or die. Mm -hmm. She just give up. You know, you don't need to go through all these things. Just... You know, so, you know, and this is an important principle for us to realize that, you know, there's no guarantee that we are going through these things together. Sometimes, you know, the, the Apostle Paul, sometimes 
were all kinds of people with him? Sometimes. But was he sometimes all by himself? Yeah. He says that my first answer, no man stood with me. I forgot it would not be, um, that you would not, that, nevertheless, the Lord stood with me. I pray that this would not be laid to their charge. That they, really, that they would recover themselves. Because God isn't condemning saints. They, they needed to recover them. They needed to understand that, you know what, they didn't function properly. They weren't walking consistent with who they were in Christ. And they had an opportunity to recover themselves. That it would not be laid to their charge. That, that there would be saints that would be maybe accusing them even. So, um, and then it says in verse 33, it is God that justifies. It's not talking about our justification back in Romans 3. Our, our receiving eternal life is not in view, is it? It's, it's that God has made us fit, spirit, spiritual fitness to receive what God wants to give us. He wants us to be conformed to Christ's likeness. He wants us to be a joint heir with Christ. He wants to give us all things. God justifies it. Look over at first. Corinthians chapter 4. Hold your place there and we'll be right back. First Corinthians chapter 4. And Cheryl, I'm going to have you read a couple of verses here over in 1 Corinthians 4. And this is the, in the context of the Corinthians attack against the Apostle Paul's distinct Gentile apostleship. They were, they were religious. They were following teachers. But it's an attack against his distinct apostleship and against his stewardship that God himself gave him, right? He was a steward of the mysteries of God. Cheryl, do you want to read let's see um, verses 3 and 4. 1 Corinthians 4 verses 3 and 4. Uh, verses three and four. The Apostle Paul, he was a steward of the mysteries of God. And not just a steward. He says it's required of stewards that what? Found faithful. Found faithful. And was he a faithful steward? Yes. He was a faithful steward. But you know, what he was teaching was being attacked. Somebody was laying something to, the, to his charge that you're not a faithful steward. You know, you're not... And a, a just you're not you're not the apostle of the Gentiles. You go, these other people are, are apostles. They were laying something to his charge, and Paul says it is a very small thing that I should be judged to you. You know, and when people lay something to our charge, that should be our response. It's a very small thing that I should be judged by you. It's so God. You're not being godly. I, I think so. I mean, it can manifest different ways, but we're 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 following the wrong doctrine, or we're not faithful, or you know, look at these big churches out here. Why aren't you Why aren't you involved with them? You know, they know more than you do. You went to seminary. Moses, See that Moses, you're taking too much upon yourself. That's a good verse. That 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 that's a very similar yeah, principle back in the Old Testament. Very similar. And the Apostle Paul says, it's a very small thing that I should be judged of you. And that's what's in view here, being judged, laying something to our charge. The charge we've been given. We've been given a, we've been given a charge to, to, to live out of our sanctified life, to progress in our godly sanctification. And the Apostle Paul, it says, Apostle Paul says, it's a very small thing that I should be judged of you. And he says, I judge not mine own self. See, God doesn't even want us to judge ourselves. He just wants us to walk in the doctrine and believe it. And then he says in verse 4, For I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified. See, that's not the justification of 
having righteousness imputed to us, that's the justification of being spiritually fit to, to be a steward of the mysteries of God. He, he was fit to do these things because God chose him. He's, he's a God-ordained apostle, a teacher of the Gentiles. He was justified to be doing what he's doing because God had his step of approval on him. So let's turn back to Romans 8. Does that make sense? I think digging into that word stewards, just exactly how important that word is to be a steward of something. And God says in one, stewards of the mysteries of God. So he's, he's being a minister of Christ and steward. That he, he's given us that stewardship of those ministries. Travis, back in the garden. Well, the ministries that went. And so, Paul, Paul's saying, hey, this, this is some serious business and be found faithful of that stewardship. That's right. And those are some specific things he's talking about that were entrusted to him and that are entrusted to us yeah. today. They are entrusted to us as we believe what the Apostle Paul I shouldn't say the Bible. Believe what God is telling us and to to continue to, to take these doctrines, form form them in our soul, and go out and teach others. That's what Paul tells Timothy, right? You will get attacked for that. That's right. Even from your owner from within. Right? That's right. That's a big somebody uh -huh. judging us. Yeah. Somebody really up, out, outright attacking us. Because you know, there's a religious system out there that it's it's really of no value to God. It's of no value. If you're not teaching the proper doctrines, if you're not teaching the, the doctrines that were committed to the Apostle Paul and that he committed to us today, that you're not really a faithful steward. Well, let's, let's go back to Romans uh, 8. And we'll touch on 34. I know we're going through these things slowly, but I think these are very important things as, as we ask ourselves each of these questions. Who is he, verse 34, 834, who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. So who is he that condemneth? Well, the question is, is, is God condemning us? Okay. Who is condemned? Christ is condemned. Who? Christ is condemned. He, he was, uh, you mean at the cross? That's true. Christ at one point, and the verse says that. Um, who, um, it is Christ that died. He died because he was condemned. He was the sin bearer. He provided propitiation, justification. So Christ was condemned today, and that was on the cross. That's not today, of course. So who is condemned today? The sinner? The un... The un Maybe the spirit. Sorry? Maybe God's spirit. God's spirit condemns? Or is condemned. The you mean people can kind of condemn God? Okay. And when they do that, they're manifesting that they're condemned when they have a certain view of God. You know, the world is condemned. How does, let me ask you this. How does a saint, can a saint come, come under condemnation? Yes. How? What doctrines will produce condemnation for us right now? Legalism. Legalism, the law program, the law program that nobody could ever keep. It was a schoolmaster, but there was no justification by keeping the law. So if, if you if, put, if, if it was a schoolmaster practicing at Christ, that means Christ had to be a perfect schoolmaster. He had to complete. No one fulfilled the law. I mean, Christ fulfilled. Christ fulfilled the law, right? Perfectly. John too. That's right. And he, you're right. Made, uh, born of a woman made under that law. So he fulfilled that law. He manifested uh, that, you know, it, it took a perfect man, God incarnate to fulfill.
fulfill that law. Nobody else could ever do it. It's a good point. Okay. So we will bring condemnation upon ourselves if we live under the, now the, the world is condemned. Now, are we, are we of the world right now? No, we're in. Okay, because we are in Christ. That's right. And there's no, you know, you know, some people look at Romans 8, 1, but that's talking about our walk. It's talking about if we walk according to the flesh, it will produce condemnation. Our flesh will produce condemnation to itself. Okay. But this is, this is talking about some things in our sanctified life that there's no condemnation, and it's going to explain it in the rest of the verse. The world is condemned. Saints can come under condemnation when they walk contrary to the doctrines that God has given us to follow, right? The doctrines that are designed to work on us to produce what? Say it again. Our sanctification. Our sanctification. Holiness, which is what really sanctification is. Godliness. Be like God. To think like God. To, to live like God wants us to live. And to labor with God. I'm not, not, not to be God. To, be, to, be, to live like what, how he wants us to live. And to labor with our Father. Okay? So we're going to go. We want to cover the rest of the verse. Because sometimes this is confusing. Um, and Paul answers the question, who is he that condemneth? And it's going to be about Jesus Christ. It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. What's that talking about? Talking about what Jesus accomplished, right? What he did, what he fully accomplished. So after he accomplished what he needed to accomplish, for the Father, for our justification and our sanctification, where is he right now? Is that the right hand of God? Who is he interceding for? Us. Is he interceding for God? He's interceding for us. What does that mean? He's a mediator between us and God. He is the mediator. And that is... Now, there's some, and that is true, and that is in the passage that is, he's a mediator, but he's also, when he says he's, he's interceding for us, he is some teaching that we need to understand for our justification and our sanctification. Everything has been provided. He's a finished work. It's in a context of our sanctification. He's writing us. Everything has been provided for us to be justified and sanctified in the Father's sight. And, you know, and there are some that misread that. They think he's interceding to God. Like the Father wants to pour out judgment, and the Son is saying, no, I paid the price. Well, let's not make the Father like he doesn't have any understanding. The Father knows what the Son did, as well as, what the, as, well as the Son. He knows everything's been provided. Christ is interceding for us, just as the Spirit's interceding for us. It's, it's some teaching. The interceding here is some teaching that we need to understand. It's all been done. It's, it's a finished work to accomplish our justification and our sanctified life. And you know what? It's, we, you know, we do have a part to play. We need to believe it. We need to know it. We need to believe it. And God wants us to apply it to the details of our life. Right? right, and we should be applying it in, 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 in all that we do. You know, and maybe initially we might say, "Well, this this isn't consistent who I am in Christ." But as these doctrines to begin to work in us, it's it's like we will naturally do these things. That's what Paul says about Timothy. He will naturally care for your state. That's living out of his sanctification. Timothy was as far as serving. Sanctification allows us to, excuse me, allows us to serve properly. Okay? Provide, provide the doctrines of his grace, the doctrines of building us up and working out of us. Any, any questions on any of those things we went over?
gives us a well, not well, there's a, a parallel verse, Colossians 3 1. Okay. It says that if ye then be risen with Christ, speak those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on our hand. So obviously, like you just said, that we have something that's, we have to say it correct. So we're seeking Christ in his sitting at the right hand of the Father. That's right. That's, so that's, that's right. Why it's his, his heavenly ministry that was given to Paul. That's a good point. And that, you know, the issue of he's sitting on the right hand, everything's been provided for not just our justification and sanctification, but there's an additional thing. I shouldn't say a thing, but there's something additional there in view, isn't there? Yeah. As far as our really, that's was that Colossians 3 1? Um, keep, keep reading there in the next verse or two. Uh, set your affections on things above, not the things of the earth. Okay. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with his glory. Okay, so there's an additional doctrine of our exaltation, our eternal glory. So it's our, you know, here it's talking primarily about our justification and our sanctified position in Christ. And there it's more advanced doctrines talking about our exaltation and our eternal glory. But it's a, it's a similar thing. Christ has provided everything for that. That's a good verse. So you walk in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, any other thoughts or questions? I like taking slow, Brian. I don't think we should ever think that we try to rush through any of these verses or anything. That if we got to review time and time again, it's this is what we're supposed to do. That's right. And and these are these are important questions for us to for each of us. Part, like, yeah. That's right. Well, this is our foundation, just like it is in advanced doctrine and Colossians or Ephesians or such. If, if we're not doing it if we're not grounded on this, then, then uh, yes, those will work. But I mean to go back and to, to be grounded in it. Yeah. That's right. And we, we need to know the fathers for us. We need to know that we can trust him implicitly because, you know, if, if we if we are just continually taking in the things of this world, what we're reading and studying here will become more distant. These things that need to be in our, our forefront of our mind. You know, our father, he's, he knows what we're going through. He's provided for us in all that we're going through. And he's he's he didn't just. Um, send his son in the world he's the most he's the only wise god he's the possessor of heaven and earth he is he's the omnipotent god and he's you know what, what we think well why doesn't he take away the, all these sufferings then? why doesn't he that's a good point how we go you know, Jesus didn't take it personally with Peter. Peter, 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 Peter wasn't upset with Peter. Sure. But now, Satan's not doing that day, but the world doesn't stay sick and dead with Peter. So the world will do it the same way. But it won't be Satan, it'll be just the world in general. Us, and we take it personally because we think it's a question of attack. Yeah. And Jesus said, if they hate you, if they hate you, if they hate you, if they hate you. That's the part that kind of rusts a little bit, and then we start poo pooing ourselves. Says, Be strong in the Lord, the power of his might. That's right. We and, have to learn that. That's right. And you know, these, these sufferings are designed to work for us because, and not the sufferings in and of themselves, right? As they work with the doctrine that God is teaching us. And the, an example of that, and we'll close with this, is the Thessalonians. Paul was there three Sabbaths. In Thessalonica. And you know what? They they began to take these doctrines and they began to run. And they be they 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 began to endure these sufferings and they began to manifest what God wanted to manifest, godly love and their ambassadorship. You know, Thessalonians, if, if you look at Paul's epistles to the churches, Thessalonians is at the end doesn't mean they knew the most. It means they were the more advanced in these doctrines working in them. 
the, the, the order of Paul's epistles is spiritual maturity, not how much they know, but how they're functioning on these doctrines. That's some, we sometimes lose sight of that. We think it's, the issue is we need to know more. We need more lessons. And that's, there's some significance to that, but it's, the, it's, it's how the word of God works in us and what it, what it, how it works out of us. One, one would be uh, First Corinthians 13. That's a great passage to go to when you're feeling hateful or that's right. Godly love is what God wants to manifest in us. And that's what the Thessalonians will manifest in. He says, You're taught of God to love one another. You know, they, they learn these things in three weeks, but they had some missing gaps. Even though they were advanced, you know, some some they had some missing link or some missing pieces, didn't they? The Thessalonians, but the rapture and death and some of these things. Uh, I think we'll stop there. Any any other questions or thoughts? Anybody would like to share? You got it down that quickly. Isn't that amazing? That, that, that's probably what it was. They made the most of the time. Okay.